It's longer time. Yay! Yay. Lager Time, Poems, Stories and Thoughts, by me, Paul Cree. Who else? Greetings, bonjour, what's happening? Welcome to Lager Time. Quick little intro, then we crack on with this week's piece. I'm dropping the second in a series called Satellite Stories. All of these are based on real events with a few details changed here and there. Trying to keep it as honest as possible without censoring anything. It's tough though, but I guess the truth hurts sometimes. Anyway, if you like, give it a subscribe or feel free to drop a comment. It all helps. Few bits and bobs in my online shop, like my first book, The Suburban, and some music, paulcreed.co.uk slash shop, for probably none of your needs, but needs must. Have a banging weekend. Paul. Satellite Stories Volume 2 Drunks and Bunkers St. Wolfrey's was tucked away behind Goffs Park, meaning you could access it via the school playing fields. It was forbidden to go in there unless you were a sixth former. My older brothers told me of running battles in Goffs back in their day with other schools, Thomas Bennett, ICC and Hazelwick. We'd taken to sneaking off into Goffs some lunch times to go to the little kiosk by the pitch and putt or to roll down to the Casbah on Horsham Road, which was always risky. Where the park came out, onto the main road, it was always busy with traffic and there was, of course, the level crossing. Teachers on their lunch breaks often spotted little chances who'd been caught waiting by the barriers trapped by the trains, pockets full of sweeties that were probably robbed from the Casbah. The notorious moody geezer in there had one glass eye and despite the CCTV, his shop was rife with adolescent tea leaves claiming the five finger discount. Though some sort of moral code slash anxiety told me not to, in truth, I never quite had the bollocks for shoplifting. Though I did once nick a pack of chewing gum whilst at the till paying for something as the glass-eyed geezer was distracted. Probably said a few Hail Marys after that one. I'm pretty sure it was French that I was bunking that morning. I'd long ago lost interest in school and that whole masculine-feminine thing, I could never quite get my head around it. Must have been around early spring, as some of us were still wearing coats and normal lessons were going on. That, and I remember that the ground was a bit muddy. I'd heard a few boys, Tony, Granger and Kells, were sacking off lessons and going on a jaunt into Goffs, so me and my mate Colin decided to join them. It was only ever school where you'd often form these temporary alliances with other boys you might not even be that safe with, but you all had a common purpose. And bunking off was ours, young socialists that we were. To get out, you had to sneak round the back of the gym with its big glass windows, cut across by the school kitchens, into the bus layby and into this bit of wasteland, through the bushes, then bosh, you were there, Goffs Park, the promised land. We got through undetected and were in the woods near to where the play area was. Like with most things we did back then, there was no actual plan to any of it, other than escaping, and I doubt anyone had even thought it through. So once we got into the park, we just stood around for a bit, until someone decided we should bop to the Casbah. This lack of planning was probably reflected in our combined academic performances. On the surface, Goss was a pleasant patch of green, though always a bit gloomy. We had the pitch and putt up the back, and in the summer, a little miniature railway. Yet it was a haven for all sorts of wrongers, and I'd heard there was a remand centre in there somewhere. Only a few weeks before, we'd almost been caught bunking by a squad of police officers surrounding the pond, whilst a few divers were searching for a knife that had apparently been used to stab a guy to death just down the road. 
There was also a known sex case of the flashing sort they used to operate out there waiting for the schoolgirls to come in. Back when I was in year 9, I remember one lunchtime a guy got battered in there by a bunch of kids a few years above. He'd come onto the school field at lunchtime and slapped a kid in my year, some revenge attack on behalf of his younger brother. There was some big assembly about it afterwards, and loads of boys, like my mate Rich, went about claiming to have laid a boot in. Though he definitely didn't, because I was with him. The geezer got bashed up pretty bad by all accounts. Though these incidences were largely few and far between, you still had to have your wits about you. We were bowling back from the Casbah and had gotten back into the park. Most of the boys loaded up with sweeties, Tony Doyle being a top thief, munching away when I saw my brother. He was in sixth form at the time and presumably on a free period. All the other boys went on ahead. He had a bit of a pop at me, knowing full well what I was up to. I felt pretty bad but also enjoyed the sort of naughty kid reputation I had within my family, even though I was never really that bad. I think he probably saw through it all, knowing I wasn't much of a bad boy, wasn't even that good at pretending to be one. But minor acts of bad boy behaviour, like bunking off, I could do, and it gave me a tiny shred of clout in that warped aspirational ideal that so many of us tried to live up to. In our ranks, Kells was the hardest, he could easily switch and go from being a loudmouth to a solid fast moving block of rage clumping whatever was in front of him. Most of the time though, he was a bit of a knob, gobby but a good laugh. All the rude boys tended to leave him alone, knowing he could mix it if he wanted. My mate Colin could fight, he was huge for his age and had fists like shovels. Because of this, he often had to contend with cocky white boys, often backed by a pack of mates trying to dick swing with him. But like me, he didn't like fighting and was quite gentle at heart. But unlike me, he had to put up with getting started on all the time. Then there was Granger and Tony Doyle. Granger was alright, all mouth but no trousers as my dad would say, a bit of a clown. And Doyle was quiet, didn't make a fuss. But all in all they were game for a laugh and none of us were up to much in our projected GCSE grace. We didn't know it at the time but we were all destined for the post-16 Blairite dream of useless GMVQs. We were just wandering round aimlessly, walking up a slight hill just in front of the woods by the old house. We'd split up, with Granger, Kells and Doyle up ahead, me and Colin just talking at the back. I'd noticed an older woman, probably mid-40s maybe, lots of makeup and scraggy blonde hair walking a dog coming towards us. I think she had some sort of drink in one of her hands. She was wearing black sunglasses and I remember thinking, something's not right here. Nat Granger has gone right up to her face, leant in and gone, woof woof, and run back to where Kells and Doyle were. It was like she was sleepwalking and suddenly launched into life. You fucking little cunts, you fucking little gay boys, fuck off, fuck off, come here you little cunts, fucking gay boy cunts. Granger and Kells were cracking up, laughing at this woman who I'd now realised was pissed out of her face, when all of a sudden this geezer with a ponytail appears out of nowhere holding a can of special brew and starts charging at us. Granger, Kells and Doyle were long gone, bolting back up into the woods and with me and Colin right at the back and Colin the closest, he comes right at us instead. He grabs Colin by his school blazer and cracks him in the face, mouthing various obscenities. I don't fully remember exactly, but we weren't flowery language and spit was flying out of his mouth. Colin fell back onto one leg and would have gone fully over, but the guy still had hold of his blazer. It was like he was hopping trying to keep his balance and fight back. Colin's massive and his unnecessarily oversized football bag was wedged between the two of them, which probably worked in his favour. Colin was slightly taller than him, but either way, this guy was a man with man strength. This weren't no lunchtime punch-up. Once. The drunk dog walker must have had some mystical hold over this guy because at that he let go of Colin and charged off into the woods. This whole time though I'd stood there frozen as this geezer slapped my mate not knowing what to do. It all seemed to happen in the space of a few very short moments whilst also wondering where on earth this angry geezer had appeared from 
It was like he teleported right to where we were from some bare knuckle pit somewhere and he was angry at the inconvenience. Colin was alright though. The guy had only caught him on the cheek. Bit shaken up, but we made our way back into school via a different route. Didn't see that other woman or the ponytail pit fighter again, thank God. We caught up with the other boys and they were laughing their heads off. And I remember feeling angry as we, or Colin more like, Almost got our heads kicked in by some wino, all because of Granger, running his mouth off and then pussying out by giving it toes. So much for the solidarity. Next day, Granger and Kells had told everyone this guy had started on us and they slapped him up. I was partly scared that the school would find out, and they never did. I doubt anyone wanted to admit it, that we were probably all shitting ourselves though. Or maybe it was just me. All that because I didn't want to go to a French lesson. C'est la vie. It's longer time. Yay! Yay! Longer time. Poems, stories and thoughts. By me, Paul Cree. Who else?